wants to take you deeper than the challenges that are in your life. So you understand exactly why Jesus is in you and why you are in Christ. Welcome to a dynamic and life-transforming program impacting generations with the Word of God. Christ has been made our wisdom. He's Christ, the wisdom and the power of God. He's not just the power without the wisdom. And it cannot be complete to be wisdom without the power. Because the wisdom of God evokes the power of God on your life. Here is the narrow make manifest with Apostle Grace Lubeck. I studied something recently on the forms of God. If you've not watched that sermon, I recommend you watch it. I preached it uh, over the weekend. But there's a lot of things that I would not finish. And, and today is not a second part of it, but today is another aspect concerning the prayers of God. And I remember I mentioned the statement and, and I said that today some people do not know how to live in the presence of God, how to be alive in the presence of God. And uh, so today I want to talk about living in the presence of God. I could not share it last time because all I shared last time was just enough or sufficient for that hour. But tonight I want to talk about what it means to live in the presence of God. Because if you're a reader of the Bible, you have seen people dying actually in the presence of God. You've seen people destroyed even in the presence, yet it's not supposed to be so. God has called us not only to live but to be alive in the presence of God. You see? Now, if you'll read with me in the Psalms, the 16th chapter, from the 11th verse, the Bible says, Thou will show me the path of life. You will show me the path of life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. And thy right hand there, at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Hallelujah. Now the psalmist says that you'll show me the path of life. And there's a full column there. Meaning that whatever is going to be mentioned after is as a result of this. Because it says in thy presence is the fullness of joy and thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We are supposed to have life. We are supposed to have the revelation of the path of life when we connect to the presence of Almighty God. Like I said, that there are forms of the presence. There are also degrees of the presence. But as we continue to increase and grow, as the knowledge of God breaks, breaks all depths and exposes us into the deeper forms of the presence of God, the highest level, of the presence of God, we must know how to walk in the path of life in the presence of God. To carry and walk in the revelation of the path of life in the revelation of God because it's supposed to show us, the presence of God is supposed to reveal to us the way of life, the path of life, how to be alive in the presence of God. If you read about the children of Israel, for example, the Bible says that a high priest went into the Holy of Holies every year for the atonement of the sins of the children of Israel. And they tell you that a rope was tied on the leg of the priest. Uh, least the priest dies and they have to pull the body out. That means it was possible for a man to die in the presence. And that means it was serious for the priests to enter the Holy of Holies with a certain order of the Spirit obeying the instructions of God as they were given to them, connecting to God as he, as he had instructed them in the way of that service. So if a priest went another way, they were slain. They were slain. We saw people in scripture who went in some of the holiest spaces of the tabernacle illegally and they were afflicted. Why? Because it's important for you to know how you ought to carry yourself in the presence of God. You must know how. You must know how to live in the presence of God. Now, if you will read with me, the Bible tells us 
and, and let, me, let me start this way. The Bible tells us, and let me take us back to the Old Testament. I remember mentioning that there were, there were symbols that were given to the children of Israel as a form of representing the praise of God in their dwelling. And one of which was a tabernacle that was built um, by instruction and pattern revealed to Moses at the mountain. And in that tabernacle also, uh, the Bible tells us that the, 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 uh, there was also an ark of the covenant that was built as well. And these symbols were to represent the presence of God. They were to represent the presence of God on the earth. Now, I wanted to use some of these things to help us understand because it's easier to understand with some physical than it is to understand with something that is unseen. Let me, for example, uh, speak about the Ark of the Covenant. I've said it once before that the Ark of the Covenant was made with earthly elements, gold, wood, and the rest. But because they followed the instruction of God to the letter, he honored that box with his presence. And his voice was always clear with that box. The Bible says the Lord spoke through the cherubims. Between the cherubims, the voice of God used to come to Moses. He honored that place of giving them a physical form of his presence because they followed the pattern that he had revealed to them. And I always emphasize that our God is a God of pattern. He has a way of anointing patterns. He has a way of anointing anything that a man will build according to the pattern that has been revealed to that man. And I don't know why people ignore that or why people take this lightly to understand the patterns of the Spirit and to walk in them as God has instructed us. He told Moses, build according to the pattern that I have showed thee at the mountain. And he built according to that pattern. And the Holy of Holies, the holiest place, the outer court, all of these things were sacred and sanctified because they obeyed God's instruction. These were normal elements and instruments used to build these things. But there's something about the glory of God coming upon something that you have built according to his instruction or pattern. You should not forget that. You should not forget that. So let me zero down a bit to, to, the, to the Ark of the Covenant. If you'll open with me in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, the third verse, it tells us what was in the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says, And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden sense and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein, listen, was the golden pot, that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. The tablets, the stone tablets of the covenant that Moses gave the children of Israel. Now, I, allow me to take some time around this to help us understand why these elements are important within the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Bible tells us that there was a, 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 a pot that had manna. And if you remember what manna was, it was the food that fell for the provision of the children of Israel while they were on their way to the wilderness. I mean, to, to the promised land, through the wilderness. So they never used to dig or toil for food. Food used to fall for them to eat. All right? Now, we know what Aaron's road represents. If you recall very well that the children of Israel had started to rebel against divine order. And God for once sought to establish divine order and cause the children of Israel to learn how to obey the ranks that God had set in the spirit. And that is why all the, 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 the roads were given of all tribes. And the next day, one road only budded. And that was put in the presence of God as a sign that the children of Israel should always respect the, the way of ranks and spiritual authority. But also, when we're talking about the, the Ten Commandments, these were instructions that were given by God himself to the children of Israel. If you're a reader of the word, I'm going to leave you, some, I'm going to leave you with something for you to go and search out. Uh, if you study the manner, 
This was given by God. If you study the rod of Aaron, this budded by the hand of God. But I also want you to take some time and study concerning the tablets of stone because there are two sets of tablets of stone uh, written in scripture. One tablet of stone was the one that God had given Moses originally. And when he comes down after, some, after days of prayer and he finds that the children of Israel by the hand and leading of Aaron had actually built uh, a golden calf and worshipped another god, he was uh, roast, he was angry, he was arced. And what did he do? The Bible tells us he broke those tablets of stone. And then he went back again in the praise of God. And God tells him, you know what? Get stone again and chisel these out. There's a difference between what God wrote on stone and what a man wrote with his own hand. If you search that out, you'll understand what manner of instruction we connect to when we say that we are dealing with the deepest form of the praise of God. But that is something that I don't know whether I'm ready to, to, to explain now because I don't think many people are able to understand uh, the meaning of that. But you're a reader of the word. I want you to search out these things. But uh, I, re I, I pray that God will give me the articulation one day to be able to explain it more firmly because I have the words of it and the understanding. But I don't feel that many people are actually able to design and understand this. But let us look at these three elements. Manna represents provision, you know, divine provision. Um, the rod of Aaron represents spiritual authority. And the tablets of stone represents divine instruction. And it says these are the things that are consecrated in the deepest form of the presence of God while the children of Israel dwelt with what they thought or knew to be the presence of God as to the pattern that God had given Moses to build uh, this Ark of the Covenant in the time when they related with God. Now, I want you to note that these elements are important because these are the very things, again, that help us understand the things that are most dear to God concerning his presence. His instruction, divine authority, and how you relate in his provisions. Those three things are important. How do you respond in the provisions of God? How do you respond in the things that God has given you and you notice that these things are not toiled for, they are not worked for, you did not sweat for, and they just fell for you? How do you relate with the provisions of God that are effortless and without your own, without your own accord and, 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 and sweat and affair. How, how do you relate with those things? How do you relate with spiritual authority? Do you know those that are ahead of you? Do you know those that are with you? Do you know those that are below you? And how do you relate with each one of them? And lastly, how do you relate with the instructions of the Spirit? Because you see, I said when I was teaching about the forms of God that God dwells in all of us now. When you become born again, the Bible says, He dwells in you. He has made a home in your heart. So we don't doubt that God is 100% resident in your spirit through faith. Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. And that represents the deepest and highest form of God's presence on the earth. It's in believers. It's in you and I. And now that it's in you, the presence of God is in you wholly. You're filled and flooded with God himself. How do you relate with the provisions that come your way without your effort or sweat? How do you relate with the provisions of the Spirit that come without your, the exertion of your energy. For example, the gifts of the Spirit, the, the, the gift of the Spirit on your life, this is given by grace. You did not wake up and say, you know, let me do this. No, no, no. Even if you don't do that, the gift of God is without repentance. 
when he has given a gift or a calling, he has given it. How do you deal with the calling of God upon your life? How do you deal with the gifting of God concerning your life? Because how you respond to the gifts and callings actually defines whether you live or die in the things concerning his presence. We still have believers who are not even yet caring to know what God has called them to be and do. You will never live a complete life when you've not understood who you are and what God called you to be and do. Why are you alive? Why are you alive? Why are you alive? Why do you walk this earth? Why are you breathing oxygen and out carbon dioxide? Why has God preserved you this far? Do you believe that you were created for a particular purpose? And if you were called and, 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 and anointed for a particular purpose, what are you doing concerning that calling and that purpose? For example, the Bible says we, 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 we don't draw back. It's more than just the space of drawing back in unbelief because you're dealing with something, no? We even have spaces of men who have drawn back from the call. They've, they've, they've drawn back from, from operating as God has called them to be. They still have these abilities within them because God didn't take them away from them. But they've taken uh, the, the hand off the plow. The Bible says, and he that taketh the hand off the plow is counted unworthy. That is why the Bible says, do all diligence to make your calling and election sure. For he says, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Second Peter 1.10. He says, if you do these things, you shall never fall. You shall never fall. The other thing is, you must learn how to deal with the people that are able to promote you spiritually. Because I always tell people that not all you need is on a prayer mountain. Not all you need is is in a book. No. Some of the things you will need in this walk of Christianity will be in people, individuals. God has a way of anointing people for us, of separating people for our destiny. The Bible says eunuchs are also made of men. Go through scripture from Genesis to Revelation. God has showed us that pattern endlessly. Elisha was going to die a normal man if he had not come in contact with Elijah. Timothy would have died a very normal man if he had not come in contact with Paul. The list is endless. The list is endless. Both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. God has showed us these principles. They're very clear. Because these things should define our understanding of the presence of God. How can you dishonor who God uses and then tell me you honor the presence that God gives you? How, how does that work? That's not the way of the Spirit. That's not the way of God. You cannot dishonor the things concerning His presence and you say that you honor His presence. You see, I know believers who have a way of trying to control even the way of the Spirit to try to fix God into their comfort, to move according to their comfort, to move according to their way and interpretation of life. It's not how the things of the Spirit work. He has set certain people ahead of us. He has set certain people with us. He has set certain people below us. Even as men of God, the presence of God is so defining for us when we understand not only how to deal with those that are above us, but even those that are with us or below us. It's important too. You must understand that. So it's not so much about how you deal with those upward only. It's also important on how you deal with those who are with you or who are below you because the spirit realm, I've already said that is not equal. We're not equal. We don't all see God the same way. We don't all understand God the same, the, the same way. He does not speak to all of us the same way. No. No. That is why you will struggle to see certain things that are available for certain people. The Bible speaks of how he reveals the deep secrets of darkness. Not all people can access the depths of the mysteries of God. It's not that we are not all called for it, but not all of us have the ability to articulate 
the mysteries of the Spirit, to interpret the mysteries of the Spirit as they are. God does not deal with us equally. He never does. Because you see, He wants to deal with us where we are able to relate and connect with Him. Hallelujah. He wants to deal with us where we are able to see Him and hear Him. Because it's useless to cast pearl and to swine. The Bible says they'll trample in it and after they'll run over you and destroy you as well. So it's actually possible for a man to be destroyed because they gave the things they were not supposed to give to the people they were not supposed to give them to. Jesus struggled on his day uh, of departure towards the time of his departure. He tells them there's many things that I want to share with you, but I see that ye are not able. Ye are not able. It ain't mean that as a, as a son of God, he did not want to give it to them. But he looked at their ability to bear them and he knew that they cannot bear them. And he said, you know what? The comforter will come, the Holy Spirit. He will teach you. So the person of the Holy Spirit also is not only in our lives to teach us the basic things of doing life, but is there to help us continue the things that Christ desired to share with us. But he was not able because we're not even in the nature that carried the ability to respond and, 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 and receive these mysteries. But now the Bible says you have an unction from on high, you know all things. It is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Now we have the ability, but not all believers have that ability, even though it's available for all believers. Like it is possible to be given a thing, it's another for you to learn to receive that thing. Some people in the faith think that because God has given you something, so it's automatic that that thing is going to work in your life. No, it's one thing for you to be given all things that pertain to life and godliness. It's one thing for you to be blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. But it's another for you to know how to connect. It's another for you to learn how to walk into that blessing. It's another for you to learn how to receive what is available for you. He says, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. He says, they shall reign in this life by this one man, Jesus Christ. But he's talking about they which receive the abundance of grace. It's, it's given. But they which receive, they which receive the abundance of grace, they which receive the free gift of righteousness, they which receive. So it's one thing to, to, to be given. It's another for you to learn to receive. And we must teach people to learn how to receive. Because it's, it even goes into how you can be or will be instructed in the things of the Spirit. Are you able to receive from your man of God? Are you able to receive from a prophet? Are you able to receive from your pastor? Are you ready to receive from somebody whom God has sent in that particular time for instruction? It's important. Many years ago, I flew in a certain nation for ministry. And I entered a ministry that was very successful, very successful ministry by all right in that nation. And um, we, we had a, an, an, um, an overnight there and we preached in the overnight. And then, uh, in fact, the preacher wanted me to stay for another week, but I told him I had commitments back home and I flew back. And after two or three months, I had a vision and God showed me something in the life of this man that actually brought to the destruction of that man's ministry. And he told me, the Lord showed me it was to be in a space of three months. It scared me. And so I get my phone and I, I, I call this fellow and I tell him, hi, hi, um, I'm sorry. Well, he was older than me, he was greater than me. And I, I don't even think I was qualified in that time to, to, to share uh, th those things according to, he, to the way he beheld me. And uh, I told him, the Lord shows me that there's an attack coming on your ministry and it's going to get destroyed in a space of three months. The way he answered me, the way he responded to me, showed me that he had not received the word that the Lord had given him. And so, well, I was satisfied that I delivered the word. Three months later, a scandal started in his ministry and one thing led to another. And this ministry that you see sit by the thousands right now does not even sit more than 20 members. I saw it. I don't know whether he goes to the presence of God 
to say, help me, redeem me, rebuild me, restore me. I don't know how he prays to his God, but I don't think that he understood that the instruction of God that was available to help save his ministry unfortunately came through somebody he least expected, but he took lightly the word of God that came through God's prophet at that particular point. And the Lord showed me that he was dealing with a very, very, very indifferent spirit of pride because pride goes before a fall. That is why when we emphasize the space of humility, it's more than just your outward temperament of humbling yourself. No, the Bible is very clear. The Bible says he giveth grace to the humble. He giveth grace to the humble. But the Bible says he sees the proud from afar. So humility is not just the outward temperament. No, it's your spirit understanding that the only way you can actually stay alive in the presence of God is to learn to keep a humble spirit. The Bible says he resisteth the proud. He resisteth them. But more grace is given to them which are humble. I wish he was humble enough to receive the instruction of God when it was given him. His ministry would be standing by now. And I am sure, I bet you, from that day on, he took time to seek God concerning his ministry. But I don't think he will get the answer he so desires. Because I believe that there is a voice that died to him the day he became so indifferent to the humility of the Spirit. And these things I'm teaching you, because when you read the Bible from beginning to the end, you see many people have been so, so consistently indifferent to the things of the Spirit. Sometimes it's familiarity. Some people are, they, they, they have a certain familiarity with the presence. They have a certain familiarity with the presence. You see, to whom much is given, much is required. If you have sat in a meeting where you've seen God open a blind eye, in a meeting, where you see God open a blind eye, where you see God make a lame man walk, where you see the impossible turn possible, and you have dwelt in that kind of presence before. I tell people, it might shock you the first time when you've seen these miracles, but keep the wonder of the shock for the rest of your life and respect the presence that, that can do things of that magnitude. Because you see, you can get so used and familiar to the way God does things, that the time God wants to minister to you, he is not able because you see him in the things that are familiar. You see, we read a story uh, in Samuel. The Bible speaks of, 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 uh, of how uh, there were two boys who were brothers, Uzzah and Ahio. And um, the Bible tells us that these boys, uh, I think the father was a Abinadab, they used to, the, the, there was a time that the Ark of the Covenant was placed in Abinadab's house. And these sons, Uzan and Ahio, they, they used to see the Ark of the Covenant there. They, they dealt with it for quite some time. They, 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 they lived with the Ark of the Covenant for some time. And one day, the scriptures uh, tell us that the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant was called for by David. And so these boys arranged for the movement of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible tells us, if you will read uh, from the sixth verse, Second Samuel chapter 6, the sixth verse, he says, When they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and he died by the ark of God. Now you'll ask yourself, how can a man be killed by the ark of God? What did he do wrong for him to hold an ark that was falling off? Simple. One, there were instructions on how this ark was supposed to be carried. They had carried the ark wrongly. There were instructions on who was supposed to touch the ark. And those instructions were very clear. But I believe that Uzzah had become so familiar with the Ark of the Covenant, being that it had been in his father's house for quite some time. I think he got used to this thing that he forgot the basic instruction concerning handling 
the very element that, co that, that comprised of what we would have called the deepest presence of God on the earth at that time. And what happens? The Bible says he was slain by God. Why? Because he broke the simplest instruction. They were not supposed to touch it. There were people who were supposed to touch the ark, not Uzzah. But familiarity caused him to touch where he was not supposed to touch. The children of Israel, in, 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 in uh, 1 Samuel, the fourth chapter, if you remember very well, from about the 10th verse, uh, we will get there, but you see that there's a time when the children of Israel are, are at war with the Philistines. And then they send for the Ark of the Covenant. And when they send for the Ark of the Covenant, the scriptures tell us, they think that by carrying the Ark of the Covenant to war, they shall have victory. The Bible tells us not only were they slain, 30,000 men were killed in that battle with the presence of God. With the presence of God. Why? Because the presence of God for the children of Israel at that point appeared to be a weapon. Not a relationship. God did not bring his presence to the children of Israel to kill their enemies. He brought the presence through the Ark of the Covenant to relate with them. And now we see individuals who don't understand that the presence of God is relational. It's not supposed to be transacted. You remember Simon the sorcerer? The Bible tells us that he sees them demonstrating power and he says, let me give you money that I receive that power also that whoever I lay hands on shall receive the Holy Ghost as I see you guys do it. But you see, Simon himself had believed, the Bible tells us, but he had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit by the evidence of speaking in tongues. So why is he trying to buy a power of whose experience he does not have, except he was looking at that anointing as a transactional space? And what happens? The anger of the Lord is kindled through apostolic voice. He says, your money perish with you because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. They discover that in him was a girl of bitterness and bond of iniquity. Pray for yourself that you do not die because God was serious. God was serious. God was serious. So back to the children of Israel. Same issue. They, they, they are looking at, at, at the Ark of the Covenant as an, 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 a weapon as an instrument of war and not a space of relationship. When you say that you're going to pray and you feel the presence of God, what, how do you relate with God in the deepest form of presence that you have felt in your life? Is it the, the avenue of avenging your enemies and expressing your anger? Or is it a space that invites you to the highest form of the presence of God? Is it the place where you look at the presence of God as the opportunity for you to, to, to deal with people, to judge people? Or do you look at the presence of God as the relation that invites you to love? I know men of God who, because they know they are anointed, they live to cast everything that opposes them. He gets annoyed and he says, I'm going to pray. I'm going to make a prayer for your death. And God, God, is, God wants you to understand, I did not open a door for you to access me in the deepest form of my presence. For you to seek to fight men. No, the Bible is very clear. I shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Exodus 14, 14. You must learn never to take wars in the deepest form of the presence of God. He knows how to deal with the things that are against you and the people that fight you. And that is not, the, no, no, no. Learn to enjoy the presence of God because there you find liberty. There you find joy. There you find peace. There you find grace. There you find love. In fact, for a man who has actually tested that form of presence it is hard for you to carry anger because love invited you into that form of presence love invited you into that form of presence it's difficult for God to deal with an individual who is very angry in the presence I tell people learn to heal 
in the presence of God. Do not ever think that the presence of God is a space of fighting. Never use the presence of God as a weapon. Say, oh, they have annoyed me. Let me go and pray. Then they go in the presence of God. And as they are praying, they send all manner of what actually scripturally is witchcraft. Our God is a God of love. And vengeance belongs to God. Vengeance belongs to God. Oh, Father, kill them. Oh, Father, let, let, them, let them not see good. I decree and I declare that their legs will not walk. Why? Why? Why would you lose the... Why would you waste your time with the things that oppose you? God has invited you to a presence that not only can and will preserve you, but that presence can lift you above anything that attacks you. It can lift you above anything that sets itself against you. And then you step so low and look at that presence as an instrument. As an instrument. The children of Israel were slain, 30,000 of them. And the Philistines took the covenant. And when the Philistines take the covenant, they also handle it as a weapon. And because they don't get it. They think that they were just stronger than the children of Israel. But the Ark of the Covenant is still a weapon. And what happens? The Philistines are slain because they're taking the Ark of the Covenant as an instrument. It's not relational. They don't have a relationship with this God. And they think that they can carry that presence and manipulate it to defeat their enemies. But I'll not blame them. They don't know better. And what happens? They're slain too. Disease befalls them. Destruction goes around everything that they touch. Why? Because they're dealing with the presence of God as though it was some sort of thing, like a toy. Like a child has a toy in their hands. They don't understand the preciousness of this covenant. Yet, when that same house is taken to the house of Obed-Edom, the Bible says he prospered. It's in 2 Samuel, the 6th chapter, the 10th verse. The Bible says, so David uh, would not remove the ark of the Lord and to him into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house, the house of Obededom, the Gittite. And the Bible says, and the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obededom, the Gittite, three months. And the Bible says, and the Lord blessed Obededom and all his household. The very thing that has and can bless is the very thing killing men. Because everyone relates with it differently. You see Obededom respond to the ark of the covenant with the respect to the presence of God following all the principles that are given and laid down concerning the Ark of the Covenant. Concerning that thing that represented the deepest form of God's presence on the earth. And guess what? The Bible says that the house of obed Edom prospered. I tell people, you cannot be a, the kind of individual who deals with the presence of God respectfully and you have war in your house. It's not possible. You cannot know how to deal with the things concerning the presence of God and you have war in your household. No, your household will have peace. Your household will have a sort of tranquility. Your household will have a sort of, of, of glory. Your household will have a sort of prosperity. Your household will have a sort of provision. Your household will have a sort of preservation. Why? Because you deal with the presence of God the right way. You deal with the presence of God the right way. Do not take for granted when you stand in the presence that can make all things possible. That can make all things possible. I tell people I have seen all manner of miracles. I still see miracles up to today. But every time I stand on this altar, I stand on this altar with a fear, a reverence of the opportunity that is given me to preach the gospel. And oh yes, I've been preaching the gospel for quite some time now, more than 16 years of ministry. But every time I step on this altar, I step on it like it's the first day I stepped on it. Because he warned me many years ago. He said, never take for granted the fact that my presence is with you to the degrees that it's with you in the forms that is with you. You don't take the presence of God lightly. I've seen people who sit in 
in, 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 in the presence of God and they start texting. They, they start, they open conversations that are not even connected to what God is saying on that altar. And those are the same people that actually come for counseling. Those are the people that actually seek deliverance and prayer. Why? Because they do not know how to deal with the presence of God. They don't understand the seriousness of God being in the midst of them. Of God being in the midst of them. He says, take heed from the Holy One in the midst of you. When you tune in as someone and you're saying, I'm going to listen to God concerning a message, remove everything that should dis distort your focus, anything that should disturb your attention. Because the message of God is it's not just words. These words are spirit and they are life. And they can save you. He can save you. If somebody tunes in a service and then they're, they're doing things that are not connected to what God is saying. You're on television, but you're playing with your child. You're playing with so-and-so. You're sending messages of business. You're doing all that. And you're saying that you are attending to God. No, when you know that you are listening to the truth, Give the truth the due honor that it deserves. You'll be amazed at what God, let me tell you, again, I said, if you have not understood this mystery, you will have war in your own household. Things will fall apart before you and you're not able to control them. Why? Because you don't deal with the presence of God respectfully. You deal with it with infamiliarity. You don't understand how the ranks of the spirit operate. You don't understand how the provisions of God operate. You don't understand how the instructions, the laws of God operate. You take that lightly. God is a jealous God. I want you to understand that. He's a jealous God. I don't know why people think only on that jealousy to the end when he's fighting your enemies. No, he's jealous. He's a jealous God. Why would you sit in the presence to listen to the word and you're sharing the attention that he has for you with something else. What do you think that does to the Spirit of God? Why would you do that? Why, why do you divert your attention when you're listening to the most holiest form of God's instruction? Why do you divert it? And you're the same person going to go and pray around in the sick because you, you need help. But when you tuned in a CD to listen, did you really take time to listen to it as God speaking to you? It's like a student who sits in class and does not pay attention and expects to pass. You will not pass. You cannot pass. It's not possible. It's not possible. But you see, many people don't know that when God is speaking to us, it's more than the things the preacher is speaking. It's the things that God will speak to you as the preacher is speaking. And he needs your attention to speak those things to you. You're just one someone away from your promotion. You're just one someone away from your job. You just want someone away from your deliverance. You just want someone away for your, from your breakthrough. But you do not know it because you don't understand how God works. The Bible says he sent his word and healed all their diseases. The Bible says he sent a word in Jacob and it lit Israel. God can do one thing in his presence that will change the rest of your years in life. But it's how you cultivate a deliberate heart to know how to respond to the presence of God when it's available for you. Learn how to live in the presence. Learn how to never take the presence of God for granted. Learn how to never take the presence of God with familiarity, even when they're saying the things you think you know. Seek for the things God will speak to you in what he knows you don't know you'll be amazed that he's still ready to speak to you, even in the most familiar scripture. Even in the most familiar scripture. That is the way of the Spirit. That is the way of God. That is the working of his patterns. That is the way. That is the way. That is the way. Define a life of respecting the presence of God. Define the life of respecting those who are called by God. Define a life of honoring the gifts that are given you freely by God. 
If you learn those three things, you will live in the presence of God. You will not die in the presence of God. You will not perish in the presence of God. You will not um, digress in the presence of God. You will not err in the presence of God. You will not. You will not. But break these three. Take these three lightly. And it doesn't matter how much you claim Jesus is in you. You see, I'll tell you one simple story. One time I went to a high school and I was invited to preach in a service. Many years ago, I, I'm amazed at how this comes back. And I'm in a meeting preaching and there are two girls that were speaking behind in the back of the meeting. And I continue preaching and I continue preaching and I continue preaching. And my spirit was vexed, was disturbed that these girls continue to talk. And the Lord gives me a word of knowledge concerning one of the girls who was talking and the second one as well. And I could see by the spirit, I could tell that one of the girls had actually a demon spirit on her. And that particular demon spirit was not letting this other girl listen to what God was saying. And by the grace of God, the Lord gives me a word of knowledge concerning the girl who they were talking to mostly. They were both talking, but there was one that, 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 that sort of was opening the conversations and the other ones were responding. And I, I, I remember I turned, in the, uh, I turned to the girls and I pointed at both of them. And I said, you girls have actually been talking through my whole preaching. And the Spirit of God has been vexed and disturbed at your speaking. And I told the girl, I said, you particular one who was opening these conversations, I see that there was a spirit, there is a spirit that is at work in you that just will not allow you to connect to the things that are defining your destiny. And as a, as, 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 as a proof of that, the girl you're seated next to actually have been, has been suffering from bad migraines. They've been so bad that when they come, she even throws up. And the girl who she was talking to started shaking like that, like a leaf. And I asked her, I've never met you. Isn't it true that you've been having very bad migraines and you even throw up in those very migraines? The friend who was talking to her as well knew it. Everybody knew it in the school that the girl had very bad migraines. And I said, the Lord is speaking this very hour not only to deliver you of those migraines, but to change your life forever. And at the time when opportunity is there for your deliverance, there's a spirit speaking through some individual to divert you from the voice of God that is available for your healing. Remember when Jesus was preaching, the Bible says the power to heal was present. It doesn't mean that, that, that he needed to direct it. No, that the power to heal was present. And it was up to the children of Israel or the people around Jesus to know how to connect to the healing that was available. Here, the miracle of a girl was available to get rid of those migraines. Had she known earlier that this was the day her migraines were to leave her, I think she would have sat on the front line. But see how a devil is walking through another individual and it is talking through the whole service. We have believers like that. They sit in the service, but they, there's something about them that just can't even make them keep quiet for a second. That's an evil spirit. And you need to deal with it. Because you will, certain things will stay dead in your life, even though you sit in the very presence that delivers others. Learn how to deal when the presence of God is available. Learn how to deal when the presence of God is available. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. Father, help us. Help us. Help us learn to live in your presence. Help us learn to relate with the things that are for your provision without our effort and energies. Help us to deal with spiritual authorities and those that we serve with and are under us. Help us to respond to your instruction, to know how to pattern ourselves in your presence because your presence is all we need. Your presence is our deliverance. Your presence is our breakthrough. Your presence is our answer. Your presence is our strength. Your presence is our glory. Your presence is our peace. Your presence is our victory. Your presence 
is our transformation. Your presence is our restoration. Your presence is our redemption. Your presence is the very form we need to live in this world. We know very well that where your presence is, men leave. Where your presence is, is a revelation of the path of life. And because of that, we cannot die early death. Because of that, we cannot die of the sicknesses that kill the sons of men. Because of that, we cannot fail. Because of that, we cannot regress. Because of that, we cannot be destroyed. Because of that, we cannot fail. Because of that, we cannot go backward. We can only go forward. Give us the wisdom and grace to know how to deal with your presence when it's available in the highest form of it. I pray that will you give our eyes to see and understand the deepest things of this form and to learn how to live and not to relate with your presence as a transaction. Not to go to you because we need jobs or cars. Not to relate with your presence as, 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 a, as a weapon. Not to come to you because we've been hurt and are sickly know that we'll have your presence with us consistently and constantly because you want to build a relationship with us you want us to fall in love with you you want us to respond to that love that you've given us in christ jesus i pray that may the simplest words that are shared sit and settle in the heart of that man or woman in their most deepest form and that their lives will be changed and transformed in the mighty name of jesus i pray for those of them that are sick right now if you're sick in your body heal 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 lungs heal Feet heal. Somebody had swollen feet. They swell always. They swell very constantly. God is healing you right now in the name of Jesus. Back issues are healing right now in the name of Jesus. Somebody has had a sight which is blur. You don't see far. Right now your eyes are opening and you're going to start reading words and seeing things you are not able to see in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you because all manner of sickness is healed in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ and say, you know what, I've not received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to give you an opportunity. I want to give you a time right now to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I cannot tell what's going to happen tomorrow or next week. But I don't know why you've tuned in today. I want to pray with you in the mighty name of Jesus that God will help you translate from darkness to light. He shed his blood for you. He died for you that you might obtain eternal life. And that is love. He loved you. The Bible says there is no name by which men are saved save the name of Jesus Christ. It's not anywhere under heaven or among men. That name will change your life. I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. If you've made that prayer, you're born again. You're born again. Please go on funeral.org slash salvation and tell us your story. I want to send you something to help you understand what it means to be born again. Or you can call us on plus 256-200-999-405. I want to hear from you. As well as those of you who have been healed and delivered in this service, you can go on fanoro.org slash testimonies and send your testimony there. Or call us on plus 256-200-999-405. I'll be so elated to hear from you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, your presence makes me whole. Heavy choir, telling Jesus.
Jesus. Jesus. by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, and timely updates. The Fenero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Venero, 